Greetings. Uh, so I recently came across this short YouTube video while perusing a channel which was recommended to me directly in an interesting correspondence with uh, Akwete Basil Amma. And uh, just to be clear, uh, Akwete, you know, Mr. Amma Basil, he didn't recommend this specific video. Rather, he recommended the channel that the video is found on. But this video really stood out for me. So I wanted to discuss it in this video. And uh, the background assumption of this video that we're going to look at is that the Eve language, Evegbe, is a form of ancient Hebrew, and therefore it can shed light on various Hebrew terms, which are presumably being treated as descendants or even corruptions of Eve terms. So this video is actually only 10 seconds long, and therefore we can play it in its, in its entirety. So, so let's jump right in, and uh, fair use. What does Talmud mean in Eve? Tamu. The head has toppled or fallen. Okay, so the argument there is that the Hebrew word Talmud is actually an Eve phrase, Ta-mu, which apparently means something like the head is toppled or the head collapsed or something like that. Uh, the video doesn't really make much of an attempt to present an argument for that position. Rather, it was simply asserted, uh, apparently on the strength of the similarity in sound between the Hebrew term and that Eve phrase. And my immediate objection would be that this approach entails removing two phonemes, right, two consonants, and thus removing two letters from how the word is spelled, right? You notice it, it would entail removing the Lamed and the Dalet from uh, Talmud. Now, the word Talmud is itself not a biblical term, but I should note that the Eve approach to Hebrew can also wind up removing phonemes from biblical Hebrew terms as well. Uh, hence why I've said in the past that this Eve Hebrew approach, if, if it was ever taken to its logical conclusion, it would undermine much of the biblical text. But whatever the case, in this video, I want to go a bit deeper as, as I think the example, this precise example, where the Hebrew word Talmud is interpreted as the Eve phrase Tamu, I think this example highlights a problem with the Eve approach. Right, and I would have proposed that this particular example is 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 a more obvious example of how this approach is rooted in an unfamiliarity with not only Hebrew but Semitic languages in general. And to drive this point home, in this video, I want to discuss the structure of the word Talmud as well as the you know similarly structured words from across the Semitic spectrum. You know, from other Semitic languages. Mainly, we'll be looking at uh, terms from Arabic and Giz in this video. So to begin, note that most Hebrew words, and in fact, most words across the spectrum of Semitic languages, go back to a triliteral root, which is to say a three-lettered root. And here on your screen, the three letters of any hypothetical triliteral root are represented by the variables R1, R2, R3. Moreover, across multiple Semitic languages, such as Hebrew, Aramaic, is, and Arabic, there are certain verbal nouns which have a structure in which the equivalent of a T, which is to say the, the tau or the ta, is prefixed to the root, right? And, and in many of these cases, a verbal noun of this structure will also include a mater lectionis, often between the second and third root letters, such as a yod or a ya, or alternatively, a wa. However, there are other terms of this structure which don't have a mater lectionis. So with that basic structure in mind, let's now return to the Hebrew word Talmud. The base root is Lamed Mem Dalet, the equivalence of LMD, which I've marked in red on your screen. And then you have the Tau at the start, which is that aforementioned T prefix here marked in blue. And this is an example of a verbal noun that includes a mater lectionis, in this case a wa, which I've marked in green. And as the root gives rise to verbs which mean to learn or teach, Talmud is a corresponding noun form which means a teaching or a study or a lesson. Now, as I noted a moment ago, this precise word, Talmud, is not a biblical term, but its root is clearly biblical, right? That root is employed in dozens of verses of the Bible, like, for example, Deuteronomy 4.5. And there is a closely related noun form, Talmid, which is found in 1 Chronicles 25.8. The word Talmid and the word Talmud are spelled almost exactly the same, save for the fact that one has a Yod where the other has a Wa. 
Now, the King James translation renders Talmid as scholar, but I suspect that the King James translators intended that along the lines of how uh, the corresponding uh, German term Schuler is used, right? Where it literally means schooler, right? One who is in school, one who's studying, one who's learning, right? In short, a student. That's how scholar is being used here. Uh, and, and that's the general understanding of the word Talmid. It means student. So if Talmud means study, a study, like in a noun form, then Talmid means a student. And likewise, if Talmud means a lesson, then Talmid means something like a learner, one who learns that lesson, right? And the point I'm trying to make here is that these terms are closely related. But aside from that, other words with the exact same structure as Talmud are found in the biblical text. For example, in the 116th Psalm, uh, specifically the 12th verse, one can find the word Tagmul, which means benefit or bounty or reward, right? And the root is Gimel Mem Lamed, right? GML, the equivalence of GML, uh, marked here in red. Uh, and that root gives rise to a related verb meaning t uh, to benefit something, you know, to, to reward something or someone, to provide some someone or something with bounty or to provide them with good. And you can see that verb in the very same psalm, which again is the 116th psalm, just a few verses prior in verse 7. So the point I'm trying to establish here is that while the precise word Talmud is not found in the Bible, its root is biblical and its structure is biblical. Now, Having established that, I'd now like to look at similarly structured verbal nouns in other Semitic languages. For example, there's a very well-known Arabic word, takbir, uh, right? It's used in Arabic to refer to the declaration of God's greatness, Allahu Akbar, right? And note that the Arabic word akbar uh, has the same kaf ba ra root as this verbal noun, takbir. So too, there's the word takfir, uh, which has the exact same structure, but a different root, right? It's popularly used to refer... Now, this isn't its only use or its only meaning, but nonetheless, it's, it seems to me most popularly used to refer to the declaration that someone is a kafir, right? A, a non-Muslim, a disbeliever, someone who covers the truth, I guess, is the way uh, some Arabic thinkers uh, describe it. But uh, if a person claims to be a Muslim and another Muslim calls him a kafir, you know, calls him a non-believer, one can say that he was making takfir on him, Right? So again, takfir is the declaration, one meaning of it is the declaration that someone is a kafir. And note that the Arabic active participle, kafir, comes from the same kaf fa ra root as this word takfir. And uh, one other Arabic word with the exact same structure is the word tawhid. And this word often comes up in discussions uh, between Christians and Muslims about God's ontology, about the nature of God. And among Orthodox Muslims, the word Tawheed is understood to mean oneness or a declaration of God's oneness. Now, s somewhat separate from Orthodox Muslim usages or limitations upon the word Tawheed, uh, that word can also mean unification, right? And, you know, in secular settings, it's used that way. And that provides us with an opportunity to transition to a similarly structured verbal noun in other Semitic languages, that being is. You see, as I touched on in a video from three years ago titled uh, Tewahedo and Tawheed, the is equivalent of the Arabic word Tawheed is Tewahedo. Uh, which likewise can mean unification. In fact, it's used to describe uh, the uh, the unification of Christ's humanity and divinity. And, and the word tewahedo would be an example of this sort of verbal noun being written without a mater lexionis. You know, the previous examples had uh, materis lexionis, which I marked in green, but tewahedo is written without a mater lexionis, right? Which is to say written without a distinct consonant to serve as a vowel, right? It's just, the structure of it is just the root and that aforementioned T prefix. Now, another example of a verbal noun of this sort in Ge'ez would be Timhirt. Uh, this particular noun happens to be feminine, so it has a feminine suffix, which I marked in gray. And an interesting example of this verbal noun being used in, in the Ge'ez translation of the Bible can be found in Luke 1.4, where one finds the phrase, Timhirta zata maharka. Uh, now, note that each of these two words employs the same root, which I've marked here in blue. And that root gives rise to verbs, meaning to teach. And of the two words on the screen, the first word is a noun, while the second word is a verb. So the noun form can refer to a teaching. As for the verb, it's in a verb stem which corresponds to the Hitpa'el uh, verb stem in Hebrew, and it's employed here in a passive sense. So the verb in this verb stem refers to being taught. And for those who are interested, I'll put the relevant page 
from uh, August uh, Dilman's lexicon on the screen. And you'll have to forgive me uh, if it's slightly confusing as while the text uh, from Luke at the top of the screen has the noun on the left and the verb on the right. In this page of Dilman's lexicon, uh, you have the opposite order with the entry for the verb on the left and the noun on the right. Uh, but whatever the case, those who wish to peruse this can pause the video or, or actually just check the video description where I, I shared a, a link to a scan of this page. And for those who are interested, and, and especially for those who might prefer that the definitions be in English rather than Latin, I can also put the relevant page from Wolf uh, Leslau's Comparative Dictionary of Is on the screen. And if you want to, you can pause the video and peruse this at your leisure. Now, the first letter of the second word, which I've marked in green, is a relative pronoun with a meaning along the lines of that or which. And uh, the last letter of the second word is a suffix, which relates to the verb being in the second person masculine singular, perfect tense. Uh, so the phrase as a whole might be translated as the lesson which you learned or the teaching which you were taught, right? And the point I'm trying to make with those translations is that these, this noun and this verb are related. And an almost identical phrase appears in the Ge'ez translation of Romans 16, 17, where one finds... Uh, the, now, the structure is basically the same, except for the fact that the noun has a second person plural uh, possessive suffix appended to it, and the verb is likewise in the second person plural because it's addressed to multiple persons. So this could be translated as your lesson which you learned or your teaching which you were taught, and of course with you and your being in the plural. Right? It's a plural you, a plural your. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we can compare the Hebrew word Talmud to the Ge'ez word Timhirt as, you know, and, and as was noted earlier, aside from the precise vocalizations, uh, the main differences here are that the Hebrew term has a mater lectionis, which the Ge'ez term lacks, while the Ge'ez term has a feminine suffix, which the Hebrew term lacks. But otherwise, their basic structures are basically the same, right? And both are verbal nouns from roots which produce verbs with meanings along the lines of to teach or to learn and to study. Oh, and by the way, that Ge'ez term, Timhirt, is... It's actually in the title of the Ge'ez translation of the Didascalia. And, you know, I'm tempted to say that the Ge'ez translation of the Didascalia is called Timhirt, though the actual title reads Timhirta Didascalia, uh, you know, the, the doctrine or the teaching of the Didascalia, right? But interestingly, in the Ge'ez translation of the Didascalia, uh, it refers, that work refers to itself as Matzhafa uh, Takshatz, a book of instruction. And that second word, Takshatz uh, is another example of a verbal noun of this structure, right? The root gives rise to verbs which can mean to instruct, among other things, and therefore this noun form, this verbal noun, you know, with that T prefix means instruction. That's one of the meanings of it anyway. And uh, similarly, in uh, the Arabic translation of the Didascalia, the work refers to itself as Al-Kitab At-Ta'lim. Uh, the book of teaching, the book of instruction. And that second word is yet another example of a verbal noun of this sort of structure, you know, which we've been examining, where you have the root and, you know, you have that T prefix. And then in this case, you have a, a mater lectionis. And, and these various terms that we just looked at, Talmud, Timhirt, Takshatz, Tahlim, they, they all bear the same basic structure, which we've been discussing, you know, with slight differences. And their meanings, their semantic ranges overlap as well. And that's basically what I wanted to convey, that the word Talmud is not only connected to a biblical Hebrew root and a biblical Hebrew structure, but so too it's related to a family of terms found across the Semitic languages, right? And, and this is the real background to this term. And it's a background which a person who only knows Evegbe or any other non-Semitic language would not really be able to appreciate, right? And this is why the Eve language cannot shed light on the Hebrew term Talmud, irrespective of whether it can produce a phrase or, you know, that sounds mildly similar. And I'm going to close this video, but before I close it, I just want to segue into a bit of a side note, a barely related side note, right? But I wanted to touch on a family of related terms, which might be described as potential false positives, right? You see, the Hebrew word Targum, which means translation, seems to have the exact same structure as the Hebrew word Talmud, 
right? And the uh, corresponding is term, tirgme, uh, as well as, uh, you know, that, that likewise seems to be of the same basic structure which, which we've discussed in this video. And likewise, uh, for the Arabic word tarjama, right? All these words mean translation, and they are definitely related to each other. Now, the color coding you see on your screen is the sort of explanation of their respective structures, which one might reach for based on what was discussed previously in this video. But that would be an error. So I remove the coloring because these words do not go back to a triliteral root. Rather, they go back to a rare quadriliteral root. In these cases, the ta or the ta, that, that T prefix, that apparent T prefix, is actually part of the root. It's not a prefix. So, you know, at least not in these languages, in Hebrew, Giz, and uh, Arabic. You know, maybe the Hebrew is a little bit debatable, but so too a use of that quadriliteral uh, ver uh, verbal root can also be found in the biblical Hebrew text, right? But, but nonetheless, this is interesting to me because while the etymology of these words is a topic of debate, some very serious Semiticists have proposed that this word goes back to an Akkadian root, which did not have that T prefix. And I mention that because I think it captures how old this verbal noun structure, the, the verbal noun structure we've been discussing, just how old it, it might be, right? It already has to be very old simply by virtue of the fact that it appears in Biblical Hebrew as well as Arabic and Ge'iz. But beyond that, the case of the word for translation in, in these languages may show that this sort of verbal noun structure may have also existed in other Semitic languages which are now extinct. In other words, while the tau or ta may be part of the root in these Hebrew, Arabic, and Ge'iz terms, that letter may have been a prefix in yet another Semitic language which these languages inherited the term from. So that would mean that this sort of structure discussed in this video, you know, with the, the, the triliteral root and then the T prefix, that structure for verbal nouns is very, very old. And I can explain this into more detail if you want to discuss it in the comment section or maybe even in subsequent videos, but I thought I'd stop here and just share that as a little bit of food for thought. Whatever the case, I'll close this video here. And as always, I welcome any comments, questions, or criticisms. You know, I don't censor anyone here, so feel free to share your thoughts, whether positive or negative. And God bless.